Welcome. Lisa Savage, welcome to Pathways to Progress. I'm here with City Councilors Victoria Pelletier and Roberto Rodriguez. We're coming to you live from the Portland Media Center, and we're here to talk about current events uh, in your city. So thanks for joining in. Um, How has it been going, Roberto and Victoria? How's your summer been so far? Uh, it's been good so far. Um, you know, we're like in the peak of summer right now. The council um, in the months of July and August, instead of having the two traditional separate meetings, we, we have one or we have them both on the same day. So it kind of takes away a little bit of our workload, um, but then it condenses all the work in one meeting. But other than that, you know, it's ongoing. Um, to me, it's been a great summer as far as work. But um, other than that, happy to be back here and, and hanging out with Victoria. Great. Yeah, it's been um, it's been a busy summer, and I do like the summer meetings. I actually didn't know that we did that, and so when I found out that we have one in July, one in August, and then we actually take August off from committee too, I thought that was that was cool. It's nice to be able to reset because I know we're gonna have a really busy fall. So mm -hmm. I, it's any time that we can kind of have a little bit of a break um, is nice. Even though I predict our meeting next Monday will be very long, but but I, I still think it's it's cool that they condense them and give us a little bit of time to enjoy summer. Great. And you went on some boats. <laughs> I did. So that's part of it. So I, we I, get through winter <laughs> in Maine so we can do things like that, right? I have had access to, to two boats and it's very exciting because normally I don't have access to any. Um, and I think I, I realized I enjoy being on a boat with a nice beverage and I was like, this is fun. Why don't I do this more often? So yeah, it was cool. <laughs> And your summer as a dad has changed a bit because your daughter's about to enter high school, high school? Yeah, and so she got a transit pass from the school district at the beginning of summer. Yes, absolutely. And this has been, I mean, I knew that she was going to uh, enjoy using the, the pass, but it, like just how independent she and her friends have been all summer long, right? So she's an eighth grader uh, or rising eighth grader. So um, all the uh, high school students in Portland public schools use the metro for their public transportation or for their school transportation. So, um, so we give them these passes. And so this summer is intended for them to get familiar with it. And um, my daughter and her friends have just been all over the city in the bus. They go to the mall. And um, you know, again, it's, it's, the purpose here is to encourage the use of public transportation from a young age and create that cultural yeah. shift. And um, if, the, if they're in an indication, it's, it's a ridiculous success. I mean, like it's really, really, I'm proud of how, how independent these young people are. Yeah, it sounds like a great idea. We are going to have a traffic question here eventually, but um, if you're ready to address some of the questions that have trickled in over the month uh, while we were preparing for the show, um, I'd like to know if you agree or disagree <coughs> with, um, Councillor Tay Chong has announced that he will not be running for re-election, and there was a Portland Press Herald interview uh, asking him to explain why. One of the things he said in that interview was, quote, it's a changing of the guard. The old council was about trying to work within the system, and the new council wants to change the system, end quote. Victoria, did you agree with that, disagree with that? Um, you know, I, I agree, and I think that that is perfectly acceptable and, and a good thing. I take that as a compliment. I'm not sure how it was meant, but I, I definitely take it as one because I think that that is a huge reason why I ran for office in the first place was to have systemic change. And I don't think that you can have anything real um, without that systemic shift. And it's going to, it does not come without growing pains. It doesn't come without challenging conversations. But again, I think we all went in there to do great work and in order to do that and make it as equitable as possible and make it so that we can really shape Portland into being a city that represents everybody, you have to have systemic change. And so to play within the system that we're given almost feels like we're just going in there and kind of shifting things around, but they're still gonna stay in the same place and have the same narrative. But to change the system in which things exist in, I think is what we're all trying to do. I mean, outside of Portland nationally, there's always gonna be um, a strive for systemic shift and I think that that's something to get excited about because that changes how we look at local government that changes how our representatives look and I think that that's actually a, a good thing so that's a huge reason why I personally um, got involved in local office okay great I agree hundred percent and I think you know the, the opportunity that we have in office and municipal office the best way that we can take advantage of it is by by looking at ways to have broad systemic impact I think that it'd be a, literally a, a bad use of our time or a waste of our time to get you know, lost in the minutia of like small little issues when we have this opportunity. 
And, you know, and we do it not just in, you know, he talked about changing of the guard as in like the votes that we take in the council, but these are also really advantageous positions in being advocates. Right? Like it connects us to, to different parts of the community. It connects us to um, people at the state level that are doing really important work at the legislature. So, you know, we want to have those connections. We want to be part of the web of systems that helps to change the way that things have worked out in the past. Because long, we've been long saying that it is those systemic inequities that we need to correct. And if we don't address it from that broad perspective, um, you know, we're, we'll never be able to really make the difference that people need us to make. Here's an unexpected question. Do you think that the person who will be elected to fill that seat is likely to be also someone who wants to change the system? Um, I mean, I don't know anyone that would run for office if they thought everything was going well. So, um, you know, I think we all <clears throat> run for different reasons, but we all want to change something or we all want to enhance um, you know, representation, what, what kind that is, I'm not sure. It will depend on who fills the seat. But I do think the current tone of the council right now, and I know when we were first running and campaigning, a lot of the narrative about us in the paper was like the most progressive council we've ever had and like what's gonna happen with all of that. And so I do think people getting involved in local office are trying to change something. And I would hope that based on the systemic change that we're really trying to accomplish that this new seat um, that is going to be filled is someone that also says, I'm ready to make longstanding impactful systemic change that will lead to just a more equitable and more representative local government. And I don't want to play it safe within these systems that very often are keeping us exactly where they want us. Cause it just hasn't been, I mean, it's working, it's working perfectly. And that's the reason why so many of us are still disenfranchised and we, we don't really have any strong, strong change into making Portland a place that really represents and supports everyone. So we'll see what happens with who fills the seat, but I'm hoping that they are looking to change the system in the ways that we are. What about you? Do you want to make any predictions here? Who, who, um, who are you going to endorse for this? Um, so I've, you know, I, of the people that have taken out um, papers for the District 3, Regina Phillips, um, I know her personally. I am going to endorse her. Um, I think very highly of her. I, I think that she, she is going to bring that perspective of how do we have a broad, um, you know, impact with our work. And I think she's going to represent that district incredibly well. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really excited for her to be a candidate. And um, yeah, and, we'll, and, and again, I'm confident that, that she'll bring that broad impact and that broad, uh, rather that view of having a broad impact. Mm -hmm. um, let's hope so. Uh, the next question is kind of, this is a good segue into the next question. This is from Marcos Miller. He lives on Munjoy Hill. Um, and he has said, the city seems to be in a holding pattern, waiting for issues of the Charter Commission and city <laughs> manager to be settled. City sta staffing is at about the 80% level, and we seem unprepared to go after opportunities. How can this leadership come from City Hall, or should it come from outside City Hall? What do you think about that? Are we in a kind of a holding pattern, and is that a bad thing or appropriate? Um, you know, I don't know. It's hard to say if it's like a bad thing or, 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 or not. Um, it's the, I think it's a reality. I, I think that there, because there is so much on, on the ballot through the charter um, and the commission questions that could change the structure of municipal government, that perhaps there is some, maybe some hesitancy of, uh, from folks about how much are we going to you know, advance at this point, knowing that there's uncertainty um, in November. Um, at the same time, I think it's, it'll be really bad practice to just kind of put everything on hold. So you, you both have to you know, meet the, the immediate needs and also continue to have long-term planning, right? We have a comprehensive plan in the city that I think still guides our work you know, primarily. So um, as long as, as, as we don't halt everything, um, I do think that, that it's important that we strike a balance <laughs> between you know, how much we commit um, and how much do we really need to be aware of the, of the environment. And um, you know, I, I, I agree that uh, things feel like there's not a lot of movement. Um, I would though like maybe push back a little bit and saying that, that there is a lot going on. Like is, we are certainly not standing still as counselors. We're having conversations specifically about the impact of, of the different ways that the Charter Commission questions and even the citizens initiatives that are gonna be on the ballot on the impact that those will have. So we're certainly um, you know, working uh, as a council and trying to figure out what our positions are gonna be in terms of you know, options that we have to um, impact you know, the outcomes, but anyways. Yeah, I well, <laughs> no, I was just like, I feel so busy. I feel like we have so much that we're doing. <laughs> hold, hold, what's up? Like holding matter, like, 
Um, no, I mean, we, we have a lot that's happening. And I, and I think as well, it, it does, I, 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 you know, definitely can understand how that looks from the perspective of someone that is not in the council, because it probably does look like we're all just on pause um, until the determinations are made in November. But, you know, we're, we're working, we're having a ton of conversations. We're preparing for a very big meeting on the 8th where we're gonna talk about the citizens' initiatives in depth. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna be talking about the charter work in depth. We're gonna be voting to see what we wanna adopt and what we wanna send to the voters. And so like there's so much happening that if anything, I think we're in like this prep mode of saying like, here's what's to come. And we're just gonna have meeting after meeting that's gonna be long and intense and filled with public comment for the next several months until we get to election day. So. You know, I think the the leadership within that definitely is and should be coming from within the walls of City Hall, but it also needs to be talked about within um, Portland because all of it is going to come to the voters in November. So people really need to start taking this time to educate themselves on what am I voting on? What are we talking about? What are the citizens' initiatives? What is the charter worked on? Let me read the report. This is really the time to get as much information as possible, attend as many meetings as possible, because all of that determination of what we see, whether it is going to go to a strong mayor model, and we're not going to have a city manager anymore is in the hands of everybody in Portland. So I would just encourage them, if it does feel like downtime, to definitely utilize that downtime to push forward and um, study as much as you can and ask us questions because we're going to be talking about it a lot at the upcoming meetings. I thought it was kind of an interesting question because summer in Maine is kind of downtime yeah. where we, we grow food, we uh, go on boats, we relax a little bit from the, you know, it's very intense to live here during the winter and it's just it's a, living is easier in the summer. So, but um, it's interesting that the fact that you have one meeting a month rather than two meetings a month really makes that one meeting a month like yeah. this avalanche of yeah. stuff to decide. So if I understand you correctly, this next meeting that's going to occur on Monday the 8th, th after that voters would know which ones are going on to the ballot for them to vote on in November and which ones the city council is going to go ahead and act on. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, we will be going through each citizen initiative and we'll have to determine whether we are adopting, adopting and amending or sending it to the ballot. And that will also be the meeting where we'll have a public hearing and so there'll be public comment for people to um, you know, weigh their input on what they think of the initiatives and what, they th what they're hoping that we do. So and do people have to one. show up in person to do that now that you're meeting in person or can they also uh, do it over Zoom? They, we still have hybrid meetings. So we while do. we're meeting in chambers and while people are welcome to come in, and I love when people come in because I just think it adds more when we have individuals there and we can see them and, and hear their, their voices, um, people can still call in because it's, it's, we'll still have a Zoom option. So if individuals can't make it, they can still um, call and make their voices heard that way. Sounds like an exciting meeting. Hopefully it won't go until 1 a.m. I feel like it might. I don't know. It's going to be long. <laughs> Well, I know that you guys get a lot of criticism as city councilors, and some of it is uh, not even valid. And when people say, you have to represent me just because you gave a speech that they didn't agree with everything in that, you know, you yeah. represent people when you vote. You don't represent people when you're out there in your personal life being yourself anyway. Here's a compliment. This one is also from Marcos Miller of Monjoy Hill. I appreciate you're asking the main turnpike authority to hold off on the Gorham Turnpike, also known as the Connector. That was a unanimous vote, wasn't it? That's the part that surprised me. I Honestly, surprised I didn't know much about the Gorham Connector. I'm like, they <laughs> unanimously, really? Linking this to expanding public transit makes sense, says uh, Marcos. What wider roles do you see Portland being able to play to address regional sprawl, traffic congestion, and land use patterns? I think, well, at first I wanted to say <laughs> <laughs> that I think it was tough in that because we voted and it was unanimous and we were excited and we talked about how it's really important if we are going to take climate and sustainability seriously that we have a study done before we move forward and I was just proud that we were all on the same page with that um, despite some public comment. I mean the majority of public comment was good. I think it was just Peter Mills of, uh, from the MTA that didn't love what we were saying. 
Um, but what was challenging, I think, was afterwards, I noticed, we got a couple emails from people that don't live in Portland, that live in Gorham and wanted the connector, and they were like, you're the Portland City Council, so I don't know why you're voting on anything that has to do with, like, they're, they were like, I don't know if you know this, but you're Portland, you're not the Gorham City Council, you're not the South Portland City Council. So to address that question, it's tough because I want us to do so much, and I want us to be a leader, really, when we're talking about um, traffic impacts and sustainability impacts and taking it seriously and leading that conversation and saying before we do anything, before we potentially cause a ton of congestion, how are we going to make sure that we're doing everything we need to do to make this as safe as possible and sustainable as possible. But the feedback that we got was also challenging because I do want us to have a regional presence, but it's hard if it's not multi-municipal and I would love for us all from all of the councils that are going to be impacted to all be on the same page I don't know if we are or we're not I didn't hear from any counselors mm -hmm. but I think that's that's the part that's hard is I want us to really get involved but then we get a little bit of pushback because people are like this is like you're not representing here you are only representing what's happening in Portland well, transit by its nature yeah. is going to be regional right because, <laughs> well, well they can build the Gorham connector all they want mm -hmm. in, to the edge of Gorham and then they have to stop yeah. because the other municipalities that they're going to go through they have to have their buy-in right um, I think probably maybe people are disappointed the people in Gorham that were like oh we're just waiting we're waiting because they already have the congestion mm -hmm. And I saw a lot, a lot of online comments like, you cannot build your way, you cannot build roads to solve traffic congestion. Every city that's ever tried that just has more, more congestion on new and yeah. fancier roads. Um, but of course, the people living in Gorman along the way are like, oh, get us out of this traffic nightmare. So what do you see as the role of the city of Portland here? What can they do? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that th that vote and, and using our, our, our you know organizations like GP Cog and and the, the people that are, the structures that are in place to to talk to our to the regional agencies that that work in transit and 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 and, and with the roads, um, like that's exactly what we need to do. Um, you know, the the different transportation agencies uh, in the region, you know, Metro and even the the the, the cruise lines, Casco Bay lines, and. Uh, in South Portland and Old Orchard Beach, you know, all of these folks, if they don't have an alignment in the way that they see the future of public transportation, they're going to be working in silos. And and like you just said, these municipalities are like we're, we're transporting the same folks to and from work and home and school and, and everything. So I think that, you know, if we can get them to align their vision into what public transportation should be in the future and how it the role that it plays in city planning and in road planning, um, then we can be there. But I don't see that alignment right now. Um, I don't know if I mentioned in, in one of our shows, um, in the PACS policy board, we had um, some ARPA funding to, um, to allocate. It was upwards of $8 million. And there was like a clear distinction between those um, agencies that wanted to use that funding to use, you know, to invest in innovative ways to bring ridership back into public transit, right? Especially bringing them back post pandemic. And then the folks that wanted to use that money to just continue their ongoing operations, kind of status quo. And it's like, no, this money from the feds is specifically meant to make the improvements, to look forward, to make the advancements in public transportation, not to do the status quo. And so if in that room with that chunk of free money, people can agree on it, you know, then that's the work that needs to get done. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so that that's one way to get a there. A lot of the other online comments that I saw were things like, it takes 10 years to build a light rail system. You know, they don't have, well, then we should have started 10 years ago. Yeah. But I mean, aren't we really in the short term talking about buses, possibly bus lanes that are dedicated and then, you know, energy efficient buses? Um, that doesn't seem like rocket science to me, right? It really doesn't. It doesn't, like, no matter what, people are going to be upset. Like, it, no matter what, people are going to be upset. That's a given. But I mean, if you're talking about yeah. building a four lane, I believe it's a four lane highway, yeah. essentially, yeah. with limited access. If you're talking about building that just for cars where <laughs> there's one or two people in them, it, clearly doing that without accommodating our existing public transit you know, potential would be really foolish, wouldn't it? It would be bad for air quality. It would yeah. be... Just it's you know it's really one of the I don't want to segue too far away from this but you know we have investments in you know the the, the EV charges the electric vehicle charging stations um, and that's considered to be you know a really positive move because we're talking about emissions and whatnot but in essence those are still autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. so as much that's infrastructure that we're living with and then 
you you know we just invested in a whole bunch of AV fast chargers. That means that those lanes for autonomous vehicles we married to them too. Mm -hmm. So we we also have to be really thoughtful about when we're looking at taking steps forward. Are we prioritizing buses and yeah. you know light because rail? Traffic jams do not prioritize. Like, oh, it's there an electric vehicle. I'll let them yeah. through. Like a traffic jam is a no. traffic jam, right? Exactly. So yeah, it's a th it's a thorny problem and definitely a regional problem. Here's another regional problem that's tricky, and this will probably be the last one we have time for. This question is from Pat Taub, who's one of your constituents in the West End. How can concerned residents of our city support the efforts of city government to alleviate the marked rise in unhoused people trying to survive in cars or on the street? Uh, Pat's a longtime resident of Portland. She's really not saying, get them out of my neighborhood. She's really saying, wow, there are so many more people living on the street this summer than I've seen before. Um, what, how can we help you, the city, solve this problem? Or should we be down pounding on doors in Augusta saying, this is not Portland's problem, this is Maine's problem? What would you suggest for the concerned citizen about housing right now? We, we all know it's a, it's a train wreck, yeah. housing. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, so, you know, we were just talking about before, you know, the need to, to, to look at these problems and, and how to have a systemic and broad impact. So I think that it, this is specifically a, a case where you do need to look at what is it that creates these ongoing homelessness issues and what is it that perpetuates the same folks having the same problems. And so that's one aspect of the work that I think is, quote unquote, always ongoing. And, and what we're kind of committed to doing. But then at the same time, probably more, or I'm, I'm thinking also part of what that question is alluding to is like, how do we meet the immediate needs of these folks? Um, and that's, that's sort of kind of like, you know, what can we do to help them get, you know, immediate shelter, food, clothing, things like that. Um, I think at this point, I'm gonna really step aside and, and give Tori the, the, the floor. She's amazing and she knows so much about local organizations and ways to, to, um, to be effective in it. So I'd, I'd love for her to just talk about ways that people can get involved to meet those, those immediate needs. Yeah, we, I mean, we're lucky in Portland to have organizations that have been doing this work and advocacy for a really long time. And so I'm thinking immediately comes to my mind is main needs, which is working really hard to provide resources for individuals who are unhoused and asylum seekers. And it's everything. It's clothing, it's books, it's food. Um, they're always posting and they're always advocating. And so I, I'm just putting that out there for individuals to Google them or look them up on social media. They always need help. They always need volunteers. Um, they always need donations, and it's just a really, really great organization that continuously provides any type of support to our unhoused community and to our asylum seekers community. I'm also thinking of Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition, um, which is another great organization that works really hard, primarily for asylum seekers, to provide resources. Um, and so, again, I, I know that in the past, I think with us at the city, we've done work with them, and we've, we've tried to highlight a lot of the stuff that they do. But this is another really helpful organization, and both of these main needs and main immigrant rights coalition, and I would put Portland, Ho Portland Housing Coalition in that as well, are these advocacy groups and uh, mutual aid groups that are working really hard to provide immediate resources to individuals so that they have food that's culturally specific, so that they have clothing, so that they have sunscreen and bug spray and all of these things that I think we just don't think of ourselves because we're privileged enough to have them and to not have to worry about having them. So the smallest donations, to these groups or the smallest kit to these groups, they always like sometimes make it fun and say like, we need kits of this or that. Um, it would go a, a long way to really providing immediate support for people that want to do uh, on the ground work until we start to figure out what we can do regionally. <clears throat> I was just uh, over the weekend, a family member of mine was trying to advocate for a woman who'd been discharged from the ER at Maine Med with a hotel voucher. Uh, the patient was in a, a wheelchair and I think it had a, some kind of injury and the hotel wouldn't let them check in because they didn't have a credit card. So there's this person with the hotel voucher. Now they can't, you know, they've been discharged from the ER and um, the problem got solved by uh, communicating with a family member. But it made me realize how those of us with privilege don't see those little built-in structural barriers to getting shelter over your head even after you've been ill or, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a very complicated, um, I have a lot of social work impulses, but from working with real professional social work uh, organizations and individuals over the years, I realized like that is a hard job. You need real training for it. And um, 
and those, those people are always telling us, we need resources, we need resources. Um, the temporary how emergency shelter that the state and the, and the city were going to build apparently has now uh, been scratched, at least for the location that they had picked, because there are some issues with renovating that uh, building to work for that purpose. Um, it made me think when I heard that, though, that at least it did sound like someone in Augusta was listening when the city of Portland said, we are now overwhelmed with asylum seekers. We love them. We want them. But we cannot guarantee them housing. We just mm -hmm. are at capacity. Um, do you feel like that was heard a little bit? or? Um, yeah, okay. Perhaps, you know, right. <clears throat> I think maybe it is a good example of, um, of the regional approach and having our partners in the state help out. Um, it didn't work out, right? We still have um the urgent need and you know thankfully the the extension on the whole on being able to use the hotels um it bought us some time but um you know i i think it's um it's still urgent that that we augment that message and, and that we do think of it as a, as a state problem as a national problem um you know we we can't not get lost in trying to identify you know one small ordinance or or you know you've even seen the uh the green new deal being blamed for it you know, we can't get lost in those silly little arguments. These are big issues that have so many impact or so many factors that impact how things work out. And, um, you know, we have to think broadly again. And the state being partners um, is crucial. We cannot do it alone here. Well, we're almost out of time. It goes so fast when we're talking, doesn't it? It just seems like we've been here for 10 minutes. Thanks so much for being here and, you know, giving us your thoughts and, and your your best work. Um, I want to make sure and thank our uh, producer and director, Warren Edgar, here at Portland Media Center and the Portland Media Center for allowing us uh, to use their wonderful studio space. Uh, we have a great tech crew on hand. Dale Ashby and Jeffrey Cooper are here tonight to help us put the show out for you. Um, and um, please let me hear from you. If you have questions, um, you can get in their DMs, but they are very, very busy people. <laughs> and um, uh, if, you, if you communicate your questions to me, I'm happy to uh, bring them up and have them on the show in the future. So thanks for watching. Thanks for being with us. Take care. Be well. Thank you.